Okay, Brian Jones, as a senior Alta Planning and Design team member, oversees the complete streets engineering and implementation projects that create active communities throughout the United States. Brian is renowned and excelled at for and excels at leading cultural transformations that are focused on strategic implementation. In doing this by aligning transportation decisions and projects, make sure that community values are understood and incorporated. Brian has delivered numerous traffic calming, road diet, trail, downtown, and complete streets projects to help move and connect people and businesses so that communities can thrive. I give you Brian Jones. Thank you very much. Um, I've been coming to the Monterey region for a long time. My dad used to have dental conventions over here, and so he'd bring us over, and then I can remember when I was in I, I was in middle school, and I think my older sister just had her first college boyfriend, and she took us on the 17-mile drive, and you have those little wayfinding stripes on the 17-mile drive, and my younger sister and I were in the back seats, and we're saying, wait, those stripes aren't on the street anymore. And somehow we got off on the 17-mile drive, and we got lost in Monterey. Uh, um, and so my little sister and I had to navigate our college sister and her boyfriend back onto that roadway. But my stepdaughter just graduated from UC Santa Cruz, and so we came over here to the region quite a bit while uh, she was over here, and, and it's such a beautiful region um, and has so many great resources and, and, and a lot of great communities and a lot of great structure. And so we want to, uh, my presentation today is going to be talking a little bit about how do we enhance those uh, great bones to make them thriving communities or, about with people in design or, or people in place, designing for people in places. I'm sorry about that. So once upon a time, and I don't know if you can see this picture, but it, we thought the world was flat, and so it kind of limited our mobility. We stayed really close to the shorelines, we didn't do that, and then we realized that the world was round, and it changed our whole philosophy about mobility in our world and how we move goods and our shipping channels and all that kind of stuff. At one point, water was about the quantity and then now we are shifting to the quality of water. There's been a dynamic shift. And, and I come from a trained, as Mia would say, the wonky traffic engineers. That was my, I learned how to build freeways and interchanges in college. And then I realized that the adaptation that uh, we were talking about a little earlier is that our, we can't really afford our freeways and our interchanges anymore. Not, a, not only uh, building them, but maintaining them. And so um, I said, well, how do we take quantity of transportation and turn it into quality of transportation? And, and it's a very different philosophy because Mia said we need to move goods efficiently and people efficiently, but really that turned into my profession saying we need to move cars efficiently, and we forgot about the people. And so what would quality of transportation look like? And that might be something different to each one of us. So this week was kind of a, an important uh, cel uh, uh, highlight in Martin Luther King's, and, and when we highlight him and he says, men often hate each other because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they cannot communicate. They cannot communicate because they are separated. Our public right-of-way can d either help connect us or separate us. Is your community connected or separated? And I'll say this, the answer could be your transportation system and roadway design. So if you feel that your community is not connected, let's look at your land use and your transportation. And I'm here to talk a little bit about the transportation part. So understanding the situation, in the early 20th century, we would build subdivisions like this, and they were really well connected. And the area dedicated to driving and parking was 21%. And then in the 21st century, it became 37.5, almost doubling the area for cars. 
we provided, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this, and our, our subdivisions went from the one on the left to the one on the right. And so let's think about little Johnny and Susie walking to school or going to the grocery store to get a lollipop or an ice cream cone, or when, when I was a kid, we went to Thrifty's or McDonald's to get an ice cream cone. They can get anywhere in their subdivision without going on a big street. Those, the, the, round, the area around that subdivision are four and six lane roadways. Now little Johnny and Susie have to go out on four and six lane roadways. And then in came the helicopter parents. We can't let you go out of our sight and we are scared because those four and six lane roadways are moving 40 to 60,000 cars at 55 miles an hour and little Johnny and Susie, you are not good enough to navigate those lanes. So little, little Johnny and Susie became chauffeured by their parents and our childhood obesity tripled in that time frame. And it has to do with our transportation system. So let me see where we're at. There we go. Our wide streets and our residential streets. We provide a two, to two car to three car garage with two cars parking on the driveway, plus areas right in front of the, the street. And we say these, these streets are created so we can have Super Bowl parties and Bible studies, and everybody can do it at the same time. So you don't have anybody coming to your party because everybody's going to your other neighbor's party, right? So we pr provide all this parking on our streets, and then we got to maintain these streets as a jurisdiction. So my background in the last 12 years, I've been in the local governments, and I've been charged with maintaining streets, building streets, and every city I've been in, besides one, could not afford to maintain their transportation. And there's only one jurisdiction in the state of California that cannot afford, that can afford to maintain their transportation system. And that's Carlsbad, California, where I spent four years. Because 20 years ago, they started putting money away, they passed measures, they did a lot of different things differently. But wide residential streets can induce speeding. I'm getting a little delay, so I might need to get a little closer. And the number one complaint I got as a city traffic engineer and a deputy transportation director is the number one complaint. Motorists drive too fast on our residential streets. So they put out these cones with the speed limit signs in the middle of my roadways. Wait, that's against my rules. You can't put anything in my roadway without a permit. Then they put up these little A-frame signs, five miles per hour, and that was in a cul-de-sac. It's only 400 feet. How fast can you go in a cul-de-sac? And we started building these shopping centers, these mega big box shopping centers. And we also created parking there for a Black Friday, right? So this is a normal day and you can see a lot of asphalt there. That asphalt is creating zero economic revenue for your community. It's not connecting your community to the transit system. It's not connecting your community, your neighborhoods to this commercial area. So now everybody is forced to get into a car and drive to these shopping centers. And oh, by the way, there's a whole bunch of studies that Walmarts per acre generate less sales tax revenue than a downtown area. So if we look at all those different areas with these big shopping, seas of parking lots, and then we say, what is the understanding of the situation? And here's a lot of people in their cars. There's the cars that we're designing the roadways for, and there's the people in the cars, right? And how can we move those people differently? And, and who looks a little bit like the left, right? Right? So, or to the right. And, and you know, I used to go to 7-Eleven, get my big gulp, right? And I'd drive there, and I was getting the exercise right on my ankle, right? But my gut was getting bigger, right? But if I walk more, I might be more in the middle. So I say pedestrians are the indicator species. We protect everything else in California. Why don't we start protecting pedestrians? The people that make up our communities. But our transportation food chain is to design for that allied semi-truck that moves my wife's shoes up and down the state as we move around the state for jobs, right? She's got another one for her clothes and we got some for our furniture. She hates when I share her shoe story in that semi-truck, but, but what we're losing is this little girl 
that doesn't feel safe on our street in a residential street. What we lose is the kids walking and biking to school. And that's the bottom of our food chain. So why don't we flip that food chain upside down and start designing for our most vulnerable user, the people in our communities? Because who makes up our community? It's not cars. But we design for that orange semi-truck. But safety, at 40 miles an hour, you have an 85% chance of dying in a collision. At 20 miles per hour, you have a really good chance of surviving it. Yet we build our roadways knowing that you're going to die in a collision. And, and most collisions are caused by humans making makes, mistakes or poor decisions. And we all are humans, and we all make mistakes and poor decisions. So why don't we start figuring out how to build a transportation system so that when you make a dis poor decision or a mistake, that you don't kill people while you do it. And unfortunately, in, Cal in America, 32,000 people are dying every year. If our airline system was killing 32,000 people, we wouldn't let airplanes leave our airports. They'd be grounded. And here's really what the situation is. At 15 miles per hour, somebody can see this big, wide roadway. They can see the people on the streets. They can see the storefronts. Oh my gosh, that's economic development. They can see the storefronts along the street. At 30 miles an hour, they can't see the people or the storefronts. But I have real estate developers calling me all the time. How many cars drive down the street? And I'm like, that's the wrong question to be asking me. How fast are they driving? Because if they're driving fast, they don't even see your business. That's why McDonald's does this big golden arches and, and lets their fumes of their smell of their french fries out so you can pull into their drive through right? So here's a city in Carlsbad, and they had some large uh, arterial and collector roadways, and here's a six-lane roadway called El Camino Real, a pretty historic corridor in California. And it's about six to eight lanes wide, and you can see right there, I had to use the arrow to show the pedestrian crossing that 140-foot crosswalk, right? And I say, those motorists are stopping for that car, or for that pedestrian, for a red light, just like well-trained dog stop for that cat at the Canine Academy, right? What happens if they miss that red light? Or they weren't really trained what a red light means? Or they didn't think the red light applied to them at that moment? Or they were in too big of a hurry? Or they were drunk? Oh my gosh, that pedestrian just got run over. But here's what we're doing. We're designing our roadways for level of service. Level of service, you ask? What's that? And then we put a grade system to it, which is A through F. And, and in school, we're trained to get an A, yet in transportation, we gotta blend that a little bit. But here's a roadway, and the grayed out area is trying to meet a level of service C or D qualification. And this happens to be in the city of Folsom when it was about 20 years ago, and I was doing some planning work and some engineering work, and we tried to tell them that to meet their policy, they would have to double the asphalt at that intersection. And they were going to put the subdivision on all the other corners, and the commercial was up there already built. And we said, your pedestrians and bicyclists aren't going to go to that commercial area. Because they're now going to have to cross, they're doubling the width of a pedestrian crossing. Oh, wait, we got a whole bunch of people that are getting older, and they walk slower. And then the American Disability Act changed our crossing time for pedestrians. So now we give them more time. So now the motorists that are standing at this, sitting at this intersection waiting at a red light are getting furious because if a one pedestrian crosses this intersection, it messes up the entire intersection. And then as a result, you don't see any pedestrians at these big intersections. So level of service from a perspective, and this is just a good rule of thumb, on the one on the left, to an economist, that's level of service F. You're not getting much bang for your buck. To a driver, it's level service A. I can drive as fast as I want on this roadway, as long as I get some green lights, right? And on the, on the right, the driver is level service F. And to economists, that's level service A. You're, you're moving a lot of people on that roadway. And somewhere we have to balance that, and a lot of jurisdictions said, oh, let's make it C, or let's make it D, or, oh, we can't afford C or D. We can't, our developers can't afford the impact fees for C and D, and, oh wait, the land uses aren't generating the, the economic value to maintain roadways be, built at C and D. So now 20 to 40 to 50 years, and depending on how old your jurisdiction is, 
you're starting to see a whole bunch of potholes in your communities. And the cities are saying, we can barely keep up with our potholes, let alone fixing and rehabilitating our roadways. So here is an example in, in the city of Carlsbad, and I use this example. Here's a roadway on the left built before level of service was invented. Most of our rules, policies, and the government are human-made. So if we made them, we can also change them, right? So this one on the left was built, and it's a two-lane roadway. It moves 9,000 cars at 35 miles an hour. It goes by an elementary school. And on the right, that's a five-lane roadway. It also moves 9,000 cars, but at 55 miles an hour. It's a killing machine. You can drive as fast as you want on there. It even has a two-way left turn lane because the standard told them to do that, and there's no driveways on this roadway. So where are they turning to? That's an extra 12 feet of asphalt they have to maintain because no one saw that this was going through a valley and there would be no construction or driveways on either side of it, right? So wide roadways equal extra asphalt to maintain, barriers to pedestrian to cross. Oh, we didn't even mention that we gotta enforce those roadways because if you build them so that people feel really safe to speed on them, we gotta have enforcement out there. And our police officers are already strapped as it is do handling crime issues. And then we gotta do faster speeds, higher severity of injury. So now we have the fire department responding to these collisions caused by really wide roadways. And then we have a poor utilization of infrastructure for an economist, higher development impact fees which get passed on to the home buyers and the businesses and the community. And by the way, there's a disclaimer. Often, wide roadways disconnect people and communities from their potential. So incomplete streets exist. So when I was in Carlsbad, they, my council member said, what are the trends going on in the professions that we need to be kind of aware of and, and moving forward as we make the vision for the next future? And we said, well, complete streets is, is, is coming up. And they didn't really like complete streets, so, they, so we, we called it livable streets because nothing should ever be complete. Uh, um, and so then they asked me, well, can you give a presentation to council about what completes are? Show them a little bit of what incomplete streets are so there's some urgency that we need to do something, but also show them where we've done some good things. So I said, well, incomplete streets exist. And here's some sidewalk that a developer built. And the transit agency put the bus stop another 100 feet up from it. So as somebody with a disability or in a wheelchair or a blind pedestrian trying to get to that, let alone Johnny or Susie or somebody elderly trying to get to that, they now have to go into the bike lane and they have to walk adjacent to a 55 mile an hour roadway. Pretty scary. And we wonder why people aren't getting on the bus at this bus stop. And no one's moving that bus stop 150 feet because the two agencies aren't talking to each other. And here's a bus stop next to a cliff and there's no way to get there, except for the farm workers that come down that cliff. They slide down that cliff. Here's a pedestrian-friendly sidewalk. It's got a barrier to protect the pedestrians from the cars or from the cars from going off the cliff into the beach. But the guy can barely get through there with a single wide stroller, let alone a double wide stroller. And then think about the pedestrian coming the opposite way. Where do they have to go? Oh, wait. They have to go into the street. They have to cross a barrier that's protecting the cars from going over the cliff, but the pedestrian has to go out in the street where the car is gonna hit that barrier to keep them on the street. Here's a great example where you have a senior community over here to the right, and you have a sidewalk, and they stop the sidewalk short of a bridge. This is a, a box culvert bridge that moves some irrigation some people say that I always put this because I own Jones Plumbing, but um, th that's not the case. But we put in the right turn lane so that motorists can have the efficiency of turning right at this location, but we can't get pedestrians across that bridge without them going into that right turn lane on a 55 mile an hour roadway. The sidewalk to nowhere. We've heard that saying before. So. The feedback loop. We got this really smart guy up in the Silicon Valley. He's sending rockets up into space in Texas, and he's, and he's building these electric cars in, in Fremont, in the Bay Area. I think it's, and he says, I think it's very important that we have a feedback, feedback loop where we're constantly thinking about what we've done and how we could do it better. How often are we thinking about how have we done things and how could we do them better? So I say a new vision. So somebody said, I'm kind of like a planager, 
That's a combination of planner and an engineer, or an adapted engineer, I, I'm, or a recovering engineer. I go to AA meetings for that. Because a lot of people say, from an engineering perspective, that we stand behind our standards. We stand behind our policies. We stand behind our whatever. And we're standing so far behind all this stuff that we're failing to be connected with our community. And so we need our community to come connect with us. So what are we planning for? If you're planning for cities and cars and traffic, you're going to get traffic. If you're planning for people and places, you're going to get people and places. One brings economic value to your community and one doesn't. One creates a liability and an expense and an ongoing maintenance. So redefine the problem to better move and connect people safely and effectively, not efficiently, effectively, so that communities can thrive. What does that look like? And to each community, that's going to be different. And I think so many times we copy and paste our policies from other communities. And I, and I can tell you that because I've seen communities do it. I can say, wow, these four jurisdictions all have the same policies for the com community. And then why did all their subdivisions look the same? Wow. So we need to focus on how are we similar, not how are we different. But we also need to focus on what is unique about our communities. What is unique about the difference between Marina and Del Rey. One's God's country, apparently, right? Maybe the other one's also God's country. <laughs> In Carlsbad, we changed the roadways from collectors to connectors. We stopped collecting cars and we started connecting people. And here's what happens on the roadways. The drums come out. The people start gathering. This is at nighttime. We put some pretty street lights we stayed at the hotel down there. Uh, what was that hotel? Portola. The, the Portola. Uh, um, down there in uh, Monterey. And they have these really cute lights up in the trees. So we copied that. And we put really cute lights up in our downtown area. And it made fe people feel safer at night. I don't know if you can see this picture. It's a little dark. But it's got a lot of little patio areas. And, and the sidewalk is a lot wider. A lot of times, if you look at our public right-of-way, and if you look at right-of-way, 5, 10% of the public right-of-way is given to people. The other 85 to 95% of it is given to cars. I don't think my math worked out right there, but it's close. But why aren't we designing for this family to be using our roadways? And here's a buffered bike lane that makes them feel a little safer. Why aren't we putting street fairs on our streets to bring people to our communities and showcase our communities? Livable streets, it's, it's going beyond the automobile. It's not saying no automobile. It's just creating an environment where people and places can occur in your community. So it looks from storefront to storefront. It takes in the land uses on both sides, the people space on both sides, the landscaping, the public art. We have to go to a museum to see art, but we could have art in every single one of our communities that you just walk around the communities and see the great art and, and culture that exists in your community. So defining livable streets, I sat down with my city and I said, what does livable streets mean to you? And they made this little word cloud. There's, this is kind of becoming popular today because we've seen it in almost every presentation. Connectivity. Oh my gosh, that was one of the vision statements of what this area wants to be in the future. We want to be connected. So how do we do that from a physical, a functional, and an experiential way in our communities? Well, defining livable streets creates welcoming and inviting streets. Think about a street that makes you feel welcome and inviting. Think about a street that doesn't. What's the difference? Improves the quality of life. Balances moving people, not just cars. Walking, biking, and public transportation. Enhances safety. Oh my gosh, and here's a ringer for this area. Economic vitality. We want to use economic vitality into this region. Maybe we can do it with our transportation system here. So how do we take that quantity of transportation that we designed for cars and build it into a quality of transportation? And part of it goes from providing for the demand to managing the demand and providing choices. And around place, we heard about smart growth from Dina and urban 
equity, climate change, local food systems, transportation land use, historic preservation, public health, local economies, community engagement. Those are all things that this region has. And so how do we bring those together to create a real, from a regional perspective and from a local perspective to create a really cool place or enhance the really cool place that exists here? And my friend Victor and John wrote a really cool book. It's called, I'll tell you, The Secret to Great Cities and Towns. It's the street design. How are you designing your streets? Are you following standards, or are you thinking about the people that are using those streets? So I say, what can, we, what can the street do for us? And instead of just looking at efficiency and goods movement, more pave, which results in more pavement and more capacity, which re results in more enforcement, higher development impact fees, and everything else that goes in more enforcement, what else could we measure? Increased on-street parking use, increased walking, increased biking, decreased noise. I'm working with a city right now that says, we put all this outdoor dining along our street, but we can't hear each other having a romantic conversation in the outdoor dining because the car traffic is right there going 40 miles an hour. I said, well, if you slow it down to 20, you might be able to have a romantic conversation. And they might actually even see the restaurant that's on the side. Because remember, we have the circle that gets smaller and bigger depending on the speed of the traffic, right? So efficiency is doing the right, doing things right. And as traffic engineers, we beat that horse to death. And then we beat it some more. We focused on doing things really, 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 really efficiently. So much so that we built a system that we can't afford to build and we can't afford to maintain. So now we have to start saying, how can we be effective planagers, adapted engineers, and doing the right things? What are those right things? Different goals result in different outcomes. So if I'm a building an efficient system versus an effective system, those are two different goals. If I'm building a system for cars versus people and places, those are two different goals. They also result in two different outcomes. So new performance measures go beyond the level of service. Connectivity, economic prosperity, recruitment of employees, we heard that earlier today. Eliminate facility uh, fatalities, reduce collisions, improve public health. How many businesses have to provide public health and if they can have healthier employees, their premiums go down. Then they can cover a greater percentage of the health premiums. But with unhealthy employees, they, got, they have to have higher premiums, so then they pay less of the health care uh, premium. So then their employee has to take on more of that burden. All travelers seek a similar experience. Con convenience, safety, comfort, reasonable travel time, low cost, reliability. How many travelers are talking about speed? Yet we design things around speed first. Creating opportunities from perceived challenges. In Carlsbad, we had a whole residential neighborhood management plan. And it started out with um, designing, um, it had an enforcement and education component, and then we went directly to a $300,000 traffic calming program for that residential street. And my council said, wow, there's, or there's 30 streets on that list. At $300,000 times 30 streets, that's $9 million. Stop the presses. We can't make these people feel safe in their residential streets anymore. That's too expensive. So then we added in this phase two traffic management, and we started just putting in stop signs. And you would have th thought we broke every traffic engineering rule in the book. Because it's, there's, a, there's a rule that says you should not use stop signs for traffic control, or traffic management, or traffic calming. So then we took the residential street, th this is a five lane roadway that connects the people with the beach. And you can see the guy with the surfboard running across the street. My council said, we gotta figure out a way to get people from their homes and from the hotels to the beaches without getting ro run over on this five lane roadway. So we identified five crossing locations with the, the triangles there. We said, here's the roadway. We created a visual rendering of what our potential is with a pe pedestrian median crossings. And then we built it. It looks pretty close to the visual rendering. And that's what it looks like from an aerial if you're an engineer. And we took this intersection, this is kind of a hairy intersection because I don't use the word dangerous because it opens up a lot of liability. Uh, um, 
And we said, what can we do here at this intersection? We got a hotel on the left and a 7-Eleven Slurpee on the right. And we got the beach on the left. So they were going from the hotel to the 7-Eleven Slurpee because you can't have alcohol on the beach. But if you put it in a Slurpee, no one knows. <laughs> so then they were walking back across the street. So we said, well, why don't we do this? And the 7-Eleven owner was concerned I was going to cut off access to his building. And then he realized that no one had to drive to his building anymore because they had a crosswalk to his building. And he goes, wow, I have an empty parking lot now. On this roadway, we put in bike lanes. We narrowed up the lanes to nine, nine and a half feet. And, and my staff said I was going to kill somebody. I, because you're supposed to be a 12-foot lane, which is the same lane width as a freeway where we drive 55 to 80 miles an hour. And here's the semis using that nine-foot lane, even though they're 10 feet wide. Here's another semi-truck. Oh, and here's a bus. Everybody's using it. The fire department even used it. Same pavement width. Here is a roadway where that... You can't see it in the back, but there's a mailbox back there, and that mailbox was getting hit once a, once a month. Because the high school drivers, the high school's about a quarter mile, they were doing the inside, outside, inside NASCAR move on this roadway. So we put in this bike lane to narrow up the lane. One of my council members is a former police sergeant, and he goes, you know, people are still crossing over this road, this line a little bit. So we came back in and put a buffered bike lane in there, and it really delineated where the car was supposed to be. And now the cars are away from that mailbox. On this roadway, which is the same roadway that was connecting the homes to the beach, we narrowed up the lanes to 10-foot lanes, and we put in a buffered bike lane. We moved three to 4,000 bicyclists up this corridor. They stop at our businesses, have burritos and beers. Our businesses didn't believe how many bicyclists were there until we put in this buffer, and then they were like, whoa. And they said, how do we cater to those people? And I said, just put a friendly, we're friendly to bike riders, and they'll be there. They'll tweet about it. Give them a discount if they wear a helmet. So we put in buffered bike lanes all up and down along the corridor, seven miles of them. It's the bi most bicycle-friendly corridor in, on the, along the coast. Here's a family using it. Then we put it on that side so that the doors at the beach when you're pulling out your coolers and surfboards and everything like that don't take out the bicyclists. And we narrowed up roadways to, from two to one lane by just putting in some striping on the roadway as we were maintaining it, so we resurfaced and repurposed our roadway in a very cost-effective way. We just narrowed up the roadway so that the Army-Navy Academy on one side from their academic buildings and the Army-Navy Academy athletic fields on the other side, the kids could cross without getting killed while they were getting their education and fitness. And we put in rectangular rapid flashing beacons. We put in speed feedback signs to let people know, reminder, it's part of the education process. We're connecting two cities. Uh, uh, to the north is Oceanside, to the south is the village in Carlsbad, both of the downtowns. This roadway was built by Caltrans. There's no, and this is the railroad that Mia was talking about that they wouldn't let bicyclists on. They didn't want to put a bridge on it or anything like that. So we said, okay, here's the roadway. There are no bike lanes, there are no sidewalk. How do people get from Oceanside to Carlsbad? The next closest crossing is two miles east of here because there's a nice one of us the lagoon there and you can't cross, you can't get in it because it's illegal, it's protected by Environmental Species Act. So you can't get through here. So we said, well, we created a visual rendering. This is great for selling concepts. The council said, wow, that looks like it's already built. When did you do that? I said, did you want it? And they said, yeah, how, how much is it gonna cost? I said, well, I already got an $800,000 grant. I only need $800,000 from you. And they're like, that's all it's gonna cost? But let me back up. This roadway was supposed to be widened to four lanes for level of service. To widen it to four lanes would have caused environmental impacts. It would have caused environmental impacts and the, with a 100 year flood, that roadway would have to be raised 10 feet in the air. Because that roadway was raised 10 feet in the air, blocked the residential views of the nice whitewater, uh, whitewater beaches down the lagoon, and they didn't want that. So we said, wow, we have environmental issues if we widen the roadway. We have visual impacts if we widen the roadway. Maybe we shouldn't widen the roadway. Maybe we should repurpose it. So we created that visual rendering. And by golly, we went out there and did that. And now a bicyclist is able to go from Carlsbad into Oceanside, or what we were really wanting to attract is people from Oceanside into Carlsbad to send their sales tax re revenue. 
and we created that buffer bike lane, the trail on the right side, all within the existing edge of pavement to edge of pavement by putting a little barrier there. We took it from three lanes to two lanes. This is a $1.6 million project. Widening the roadway was a $10 million project. The taxpayers loved us. Now we had, we had $8.4 million to go do something else with. And here's that other, here, here's part of the $1.6 million project. It's, this is another hairy intersection. If you can see, there's really not any sidewalk. There's not anything to cross the roadway. You're kind of merging with oncoming traffic, and that 35 mile per hour stencil on the roadway was just a suggestion. So we said, what if we take that intersection and we plop a roundabout there? And then we go construct it, and, then, and we have an opportunity for public art in the middle to welcome people from Oceanside. You have arrived to the wonderful city of Carlsbad. It's public art. It makes our city interesting. It creates culture. Some of that landscaping doesn't look too different than what's around here. It's a nice beach community. And that's what a roundabout looks like for an engineer. But here's where it, ha it helps improve. It takes the 32 conflict points and reduces them to eight. And those eight are fender bender collisions, not fatal T-bone and head-on collisions. So then we started visualizing the rest of the corridor along the coast, and we said, what happens if we say, this is a really auto-centric roadway? There's no sidewalk, there's a dirt path. There's a nice Corvette, though. Um, and we said, what can we do different here? We said, what if we repurpose this about people? And we created space within the public right-of-way for people. And you can see we put some people in there. And then we said, you know that where we put the pedestrian crossings to get the pedestrians across? We said, well, what if we did something different on that roadway? And we said, okay, it's a five-lane roadway. What if we came back in and we put a promenade along that corridor? How freaking cool would that be? The beach is the number one tourist attraction. Legoland is a close second. A pretty distant second. But they shut down this corridor once a year for the Carlsbad Marathon, and there's a whole bunch of people on that roadway, so obviously people want to be on that roadway, and they pay a lot of money to run in that marathon and put themselves through that agony, right? But look at that coastline, and if we created that coastline and we attracted people there and they wanted to walk there and they wanted to experience that, when I was in Fresno as a city traffic engineer, we shut down the first freeway in the state of California for a bicycle event. Caltrans said it couldn't be done. Well, they didn't quite say it couldn't be done. They just gave me a lot of parameters in which it would have to be done. So I found a few sponsors that took care of their CHP officers, my police officers, all the traffic control devices, and we shut down the freeway. We gave them some liability insurance. And we put 2,000 people up on the freeway. We brought four, uh, 24 states and 457 cities were represented in this event. It was a multi-day event where they spent money for eating, drinking, and hospitality. Not much like your Otter Classic. Not unlike your Otter Classic. While in Fresno, we started creating some branding. We, we were talking about bike racks earlier. And we said, well, we created this iBike Fresno program. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But we also, there was a tower district, which was an eclectic downtown area. And so they wanted to have their own branded bike racks. And the, there, there's the two council members and the architect that helped me design those. And they were locally manufactured, so we were creating jobs. We were putting in bike racks, we were connecting with businesses, and we were creating a brand saying, I bike Fresno, and making it cool. And we were putting these around businesses, and people could buy them, and they could sponsor them. You could put your name on them. You could say, I love so-and-so on them. I don't care what you say as long as you give me money so I can put them in front of the businesses. Or then the businesses were g giving us money to do it. Then Fresno became a bicycle-friendly community because we went out and did a really cool master plan. We created the vision. We started changing the culture. And I say vision without implementation is merely hallucination. Right? So if you're not implementing your vision, but visions and plans are great, but culture will eat them for breakfast every morning. There's another saying, right? 
So if we can't change the culture, so we created this I Bike Fresno campaign, and it, and it had the tagline, biking equals joy. Oh my gosh, I think Mia might have copied our title. Joy ride? Did we start that in Fresno, Mia? But, um, so we have this ARA fund, and we used ARA funds. We, they had, they had, that sent a whole bunch of money, and we didn't have any projects ready. But we could maintain roadways, and while we were maintaining all these roadways, we resurfaced and repurposed them and changed the striping of them. And it changed our practices for how we maintain roadways from that point forward. And we implemented, in one year, 30 miles of bike lanes. The most bike lanes we had implemented previously without private development was one mile. So in Carlsbad, I said, wow, those inverted U bike racks really worked well, well in Fresno. I wonder if they'll work in Carlsbad. And we had this really cool village that we were trying to revitalize because we kind of walked away from it for 20 years. And so it was kind of blighted. It was kind of sleepy downtown. Not really cool. And so we put in these bike the village bike racks. And we put in those bike lanes and we put in those buffered bike lanes. And there's the crews installing them. We hired a teenage girl to teach the teenage boys how to use them. <laughs> boys will do anything the girls do. It's easy as one, two, three. You just lock your bike up to them. And here's all the family bikes that were coming into the village on their bikes. We didn't even have to. And my mayor said, Brian, you put in 200 bike racks for $50,000. That's 400 parking spaces, the way I equate it. That's 400 new customers expanding to our downtown. To get 400 cars, or maybe let's just say 320 cars into a parking garage, that would have cost me $20 million. And I said, well, you want to split the difference? And he goes, well, keep doing this stuff. Keep doing this stuff. So we put in more bike racks. And then the brewery started coming, and people wanted to ride their bikes to the brewery so that they didn't have to get... Well, you can still get a BUI, but it's a little less harmful than a DUI. Uh, um, and then we had business of the year. See that really cool red sign over there that says small business of the year, 2011. They posted this on our city Facebook page. We need more bike racks. He hosted triathletes that were training, and he hosted them for breakfast almost every other day. And they would stop there. They would, there would be 30 of them or 40 of them, or in this case, maybe 50 bikes right there. These are people with disposable income coming to the town. They have this little thing called a credit card that's in that fanny pack underneath their seat. And so we put in a bike corral in a parking spot. That's my cool San Francisco Giants orange and black um, bike right there. That was before they won the championship, so I'm not a bandwagoner. Um, and being down there in the Padres, it's not very well <coughs> accepted. <coughs> um, but, so chamber, Carlsbad businesses, transportation, it's all tying in here. So then we, we repeated it right in front of this really cool chocolate and wine bar. We put another bike rack right there, and there's the crews installing it. That's what it looks like. Somebody wanted a sign there so the cars wouldn't hit it. I said, why would the cars hit it? Because if they were hitting those, they'd be hitting the car parked right behind it. But we put it in it nonetheless. We even brought Santa Claus. He vacations in Carlsbad in the summer. And he demonstrated how to use it. And then we found this other winery that just opened up. And you could see all the bikes out there. So the next morning, I was like, wow, there was four or five bikes out there. Obviously, they need some bike racks around here. So I put four blue dots down, or eight blue dots. And the next day, my crews went out there and whoop, installed them within 20 minutes. And I took the challenge, and I, and I rode this electric Pedego bike because they opened up a store in downtown Carlsbad because we invested in all this bicycle infrastructure, and they wanted to do tourism, and they, they rent you bikes, and you can ride electronically throughout our community. So I bought one of those bikes because I'm a little hefty, and we had some hills, and it was like carrying an anchor up those hills, and I don't have uh, Tina Turner legs like Mia. So I was sitting there going... I might need a little help up some of those hills. So I got this electric bike and I rode it around the city for two months straight. I lost 10 pounds by doing nothing but getting to work. 
And I would ride it to city council meetings, and my mayor would laugh because I'd put my jacket and my tie down in the basket, and I'd cruise on over there. And he'd be like, you're really doing this thing seriously. You're walking the talk or riding the talk, right? So then this was a store that opened up, and they're selling oodles of bikes out of there. They're one of the most successful Pedego stores in California. And they do all these bike tours. And so you'll see all these families running these electric bikes, and they're going around our town, much like those uh, stand-up um, segways. Thank you. Uh, um, but people are doing this, and they put romantic picnics together, and they'll give you a speaker so you can tap your iPhone in there, and you can ride along the beach, and you can take your date to wh wherever you want. And they worked with another business to create a picnic, and they can, you can go over there, and it's a one little package deal, and you can pick up your sandwiches. It's really fun. Um, and here's me on a tandem bike, and so I was looking for passengers to show and share the joy of riding a bike. Then the Pedico bike shop used my logo from the bike racks, or used the bike racks as part of their logo. Then another event came, the family fun ride. They used the bike racks for the logo. I'm like, wow, everybody's using these bike racks. It's really becoming an identifier. So then we had this intersection that was moving 8,000 pedestrians through it. And it was kind of in that area where people are going from the 7-Eleven and the, and the hotel and restaurants and whatnot to the beach. And so we tried this called, thing called a pedestrian scramble. And where you, everybody can cross any direction at all times, or, and we give a whole pedestrian phase. Because what we were having a conflict was, when motorists wanted to turn right, pedestrians were blocking the crosswalk because we had so many pedestrians crossing. So we just said, let's separate everybody and give pedestrians their own time. So then we had to make some changes because some traffic commissioner down, I, I'm not in contempt of court if I say he made some poor decisions, but he made some poor decisions to throw out all our citations for cars turning right, so we came back in and made some modifications to the traffic signal. Then we did an overlay of the roadway, and we put in some really cool striping, which you can help land the medical helicopter in um, if there's an emergency on the beach. And then we added the people back in, and within two years, we went from 8,000 pedestrians to 12,000 pedestrians going through this intersection. That's economic prosperity. Then the chamber said, wait, we, really, we want to privately fund a $275,000 sign that says Carlsbad, you have arrived. So they launched this. This just went up two months ago. People were using the pedestrian scramble for sign selfies. It became the new rage in Carlsbad. Then they did sign groupies. It brought 5,000 residents down for this sign raising and turn on. That's creating community. Here's what the chamber, Carlton Lund said. The sign is in a spot, spot is also a word for place, where people will be able to photograph it easily. The intersection of Carlsbad Boulevard and Carlsbad Village Drive has a pedestrian scramble that allows people to walk diagonally through the intersection. We had churches doing fun teenage scavenger hunts. Go to the intersection and take a picture of you crossing diagonally. It's like the most empowering thing to cross some intersection, which you can't do in most communities. And here's all the people coming out. But lots of synergy is going on in that intersection designed around people and place. The key is to start with designing it for people and place and not cars. We need to accommodate cars, but create the people in place. And then memorable moments are created and captured in our hearts, our minds, and our photographs. Aww. Creating great tra communities through transportation cre requires creating a sense of place for people. It's about connecting people to the practical ways in which their built communities can better serve their needs and values. When was the last time you asked your people their needs and values? Because most of our policies hasn't, haven't changed since the 1970s, because I've reviewed a lot of general plans. And when you ask traffic engineers, what's, what pol can you name three policies in your general plan? They say, well, there's the level of service D policy. Oh, is there anything in there about pedestrians and bicyclists? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's one that says we should build bicycle and pedestrian friendly communities. Well, how come level service D trumps building bicycle and pedestrian-friendly communities? So then in Carlsbad, we had a restaurant that said, you know, there's not enough seating in our restaurant. We want to stay in the village, but there's not an empty space to expand our business. So they said, can we create a parklet? Or, and, and again, Carlsbad didn't want to call it a parklet. We call it a curb cafe. 
So we created this Curb Cafe, and we expanded their restaurant, which created four new jobs. And I just happened to, this is what it looks like from the area, and this is all the nice, it, it was a Mexican restaurant, so they created the Mexican fl um, blanket colors there, coming draping over. It's called Garcia's. And I just happened to be walking by when they put out the plastic seats, and I got to have the first Cadillac mar margarita in there because the ABC permit extended out into the Curb Cafe. It was so cool. So the restaurant across the street wanted to do the same thing. They were like, wow, we can create this new real estate. Then down the street, they wanted to do one. And here's what they look like in Long Beach. And I say, okay, going back to those SIA parking lots, how do we change those SIA parking lots to make it more a human scale? Well, we bring the buildings out closer. We create a room or a space along the roadway. We might have transit in the roadway. We create more space for people. But we have to start with the end user's experience and work backwards to the design. Because where do serendipitous collisions occur in your community? Great creativity and innovation can occur when we build communities that allow for serendipitous can collisions, connections to occur, uh, to occur. Da, 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 da. So, so serendipitous collisions and connections to occur. When you can have people that are sitting in a patio and they say, oh, what do you do? And they say, oh, I do this. Oh, I've always wondered about that because I have this other business and I could work with you on that and we could expand our two businesses together. Kind of like what's happening in this room here. How do we create the room, uh, the, this region better? In Morgan Hill, we're working well on a project in their downtown and their business. This is the one where I said the noise was too loud next to their romantic outdoor dining. And so we came in and we worked through a whole engagement process with their downtown business association, their commu neighborhood community, and the Chamber of Commerce and the city. And we created this, we reduced it to one lane through there. We created a buffer bike lane. This is also home to specialized bikes, the headquarters for specialized bikes. But this is the way that roadway looked like back way back when in the 1930s before they paved the roadway. Then it, and that roadway was a Caltrans roadway and they relinquished that old highway when they built the freeway. And for 20 years the city had envisioned doing something different with that roadway, but they were scared to try. And so I always say, nothing scares us from trying something so much as fear itself. Fear if we're, if we're gonna be successful tomorrow because of the change. So what do we do? We go in and we do these pilot projects like Mia talked about. We do what we call tactical urbanism. We had some businesses, they have wineries there, they, they donated some wine barrels, we narrowed up the roadway, we created a little sense of peep, we didn't use cones, but we narrowed up the right of way, we created these, and we let people try out different solutions along this corridor. And then we came back and we said, what did you like? We took surveys, we asked businesses, we asked all these kind of things, and then we created that vision in that visual rendering, and now on February 16th, they're gonna be implementing that for a six month trial project, and we're gonna do before, middle, and end uh, monitoring to uh, address safety, mobility, economic, and economic business activity and vitality of the community. We're not measuring level of service. LA streets people, they're painting their streets with dots, creating a different theme on their streets. San Diego, they have buffers on both sides of their, their buffer. They took out a whole 12 foot lane and made a six foot bike lane with four foot, or two and a half, three foot buffers on either side. That looks pretty, a lot more comfortable than a five foot bike lane that's two and a half feet of it is in the gutter pan. But really is, who are you designing your roadway? For the bicyclist on the right or the bicyclist on the left? And do they need different solutions? And the bicyclist on the left helped us get to where we are today, but now we have this whole other 80% of the bicycle population that's not riding bikes today. They're called potential bike riders. But they want a different system. So we're creating protected bike lanes, cycle tracks, buffered bike lanes, trails, where they're not dealing with 55 mile an hour traffic. 
But this is what it's all about. A mother and her two daughters riding seven blocks to use the bike corral that I installed in front of the wine and chocolate shop to go in the Yo Diggity ice cream shop, the yogurt shop, and they became customers. And they didn't drive their car, so we didn't need more parking spaces for them. The mother and her two daughters got quality time with each other. They had conversations. They got exercise. And they didn't take up any more space. So are you a champion to improve your community? I'll ask it again. Are you a champion to improve your community? Raise the hands. Yeah. Are you tempted by the opportunity to make a difference in your community? Yes. So February 2nd, we're going to do the charrette to help do, create the design guidelines to help create where we're at today to where this region might want to go in the future. And a lot of there's, there's plans in place, but maybe we look at how do we enhance those? How do we create the communities that you want to be when these communities grow up? And the cool thing is these all communities have all changed. As Mia said, they changed with the fish canneries and the sardine industry when it went away. Then the army came to fix that solution. And then we lost the army, and so now what are we doing? We have CSUMB, and we have other universities in the area, and we, have, we can create communities, we can create jobs, and that's how we create active communities. Thank you. The city of Marina has four lane downtown. How do you go two lanes or slow traffic without hurting existing businesses? So you know that circle where I said, you put a circle and it, it, it's, if you're going a certain speed, this is what you're looking through. And when you're doing this, I would say probably when you have a four lane roadway, you're having people drive maybe a little too fast through that downtown. And it's not getting people seeing the businesses and if they are able to see the businesses they don't want to get out of their cars because maybe it's not the most pleasant of experience with four lanes of traffic and noise and volume and crossing the roadways so there's a lot of statistics and data and about road diets you can go google road diets you can contact me and I'll talk to you about road diets until my um, eyes are blue but what we're seeing is, is that it really helps the business economy in a downtown when you slow things down, make it a human scale again. Because just like Morgan Hill, they're saying 85% of the cars coming through our downtown are cutting through our downtown. They're not stopping at our businesses. So they're detracting from our downtown. Would you expand on the cost of maintaining an automobile infrastructure versus the cost of maintaining trails, sidewalks, transit, and so on? Wow, that's a softball. Uh, for example, let me read, oh, oh, more examples. Okay, so a roadway, when you have trucks on it, trucks do 80% of the damage. So if you reduce a roadway it, from a four-lane roadway to a three-lane roadway, and you put a two-way left turn lane in the middle of it, you're, you're effectively only messing up about 24 feet of that pavement and you put in bike lanes and people aren't using the bike lanes and a bicyclist does almost zero damage to a roadway except for if they fall over and they leave a little skin on top of it. So the, the cost of maintaining bicycle infrastructure um, is very minimal because it, it's not damaged. Now sidewalks, depending on how you build them and how you do the tree roots and that kind of thing, um, you, you, you can set yourself up for more success. Um, but roadway maintenance uh, for vehicle infrastructure is a lot more expensive because it's, you know, a lot of those roadways are four to eight inches of asphalt over another four to eight inches of a granite rock underneath it or what we call AB. And um, a sidewalk is four inches thick of just concrete. A trail might be four inches over native. A trail might be decomposed granite. A trail might be dirt. So um, there's a lot of different things there. Um, and I dropped one. And 
How many success stories did it take for city councils to start embracing pedestrian street design? Mm. The first one was the pedestrian crosswalks. Um, and that was a success because I think it was in April, they said, Brian, when, how fast can you get these done? Oh, by the way, can you get it done before Memorial Day? I'm like, well, we, we just finished the design and I'm gonna have to go out for a bid. And I'm like, I'm like, we'll do our best because you never wanna tell your council no. So as I was walking back to the office, the city manager's tapping me on the shoulder. How are you gonna get this done? I'm like, uh, I haven't quite figured that out yet. Did you over promise and are you gonna under deliver? No, if I have to go out and put the concrete in myself, I'm gonna do it. And we figured out that the, we broke down some of the things out of the project and we had a contractor come in and our street maintenance crews put up the signs and, and did some of the striping and we did a pretty cost effective solution. We just did pin on concrete curbs rather than gutting out the roadway and putting in a whole bunch of concrete. So it was a really cost effective solution. So, um, and then we just started doing one after another after another. And you'd be a surprise. We widen a roadway, spend $2 million on a right turn pocket. We get zero thank yous from the commuters in traffic because cars don't write thank you notes. We do a pedestrian scramble phase. They CC your mayor, they CC your, your council members, your city manager, you get a promotion. They're like, how can you do more of this? Because your council members get elected based on votes and they like people happy with them. So when we started doing things for people and places, the council members started getting a lot more thank you notes and they weren't doing these things for environmental reasons. They were doing it for economic development. They were doing it for uh, public safety, public health, um, uh, and connecting businesses and communities and neighborhoods. You know, we'd have full PTAs. We did a project in front of an elementary school the PTA had been battling us, sending letters. We've been telling them, no, 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 no. You can't do that because of warrant standards policies, da, 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 da. Then we said, well, what can we do? And for a lot in my career, I'm always told what I can't do. Or we focus on what we can't do, and I like to focus on what we can do. And so we go out and say, and if you phrase that to a traffic engineer, instead of saying, can you do this? They'll tell you no. But if you're talking to a traffic engineer and you say, what can we do to improve safety here? They'll come up with a whole bunch of solutions for you. So just, it's how you frame the problem and define the problem for them um, there. The Morgan think, Hill trial, what Brian, was the, yes sir. We can just do one more. Please. Okay, the Morgan Hill trial, what was the impact uh, of, on nearby streets? And in the Morgan Hill example, what was the outcome of the sales revenue? So we're starting the pilot program and implementing the test pilot starting in February. So we'll know over the next six months uh, what the results of the, the sales analysis are. And um, we're not anticipating any uh, deviation to other neighborhood streets because there's a parallel facility that's operating at like a level service A right now. So if anybody has any impact for going down this corridor, they could jump over onto that other arterial. And um, it's kind of a out of the way thing to go through the residential neighborhoods um, to get through there. So there's not real, we're not concerned about it, but we're gonna evaluate it. So we'll have that all in the data analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian.